This video is sponsored by Morning Brew. It's a free daily newsletter delivered Monday through Sunday that I'm proud to say has been a part of my morning routine for months now. See, I used to watch random videos on YouTube while I ate my bowl of cereal, but now I'm keeping up to date on business, finance, and tech. Oh, specifically, I've been keeping up with all of the craziness in the housing market. Like last week, I came across this stat saying you pretty much can't buy a new home in the US for less than $200,000 anymore when that price range actually made up the majority of the sales in 2002. I spent a fair amount of time checking out that graph as well, and that's the thing. It's not like the boring traditional news that I actively try to avoid. It's much more useful and I think upbeat and entertaining. So if any of that sounds like your kind of thing, I recommend subscribing to Morning Brew. It's completely free, it takes less than 15 seconds, and all you have to do is click the link that's in the description. <laughs> Amazon has been an insanely successful company. Let me know if you think otherwise, but I would probably identify them as the biggest success story over the past 20 years or so. Their sales have grown into the hundreds of billions of dollars, meaning they've been slowly creeping their way up to the top of the Fortune 500 list. The part that stands out to me here is the consistency to be on that list for so long without ever dropping in rank. So whether you like it or not, Amazon is one of the biggest companies out there, and there's a bit of a mystery to that, isn't there? What I mean is that they started as a small operation in the 1990s selling books online and have somehow evolved that into this massive company, seemingly involved in everything. We all know that Amazon is pretty big at this point, but my guess is that they are even bigger than many of you realize, and I say that because they have a pattern of acquiring these large businesses but maintaining their previous identities, resulting in all of these companies that Amazon owns contributing to those revenue figures, but on the surface, it may not be apparent to the public. So I think that a good way to connect the dots of their evolution while at the same time expressing their size and reach is to go through some of their bigger acquisitions. But first, it's important to know that since the very beginning, Amazon has taken pride in their long-term, customer-oriented approach. In the early days, their main competitors were traditional bookstores, so to separate themselves, they did their best to utilize all the potential advantages of being an online store. Without getting into too many details about it, overall they were able to offer a better selection with lower prices that was more convenient. When they went on the stock market in 1997, they invested most of that money into their distribution centers to improve their shipping efficiency. They felt that as long as the customer was getting the best possible experience, they would keep coming back to the site and even tell other people about it. Their prices were so low and they were spending so much to run the business that they weren't making any money. That is the long term part of it. Amazon had lost billions of dollars over the course of nine years years before they reported their first profits. So as I go through these acquisitions, keep in mind that Amazon has always been more concerned with the long-term potential and how it would affect potential customers. First off, in 1998, Amazon bought BookPages and Telebook. These are two separate companies, but they were actually bought on the same day. And this is the only one on my list that you've probably never heard of, but I do think they are significant in telling the story here because they were Amazon's first ever acquisitions and they were both online bookstores. It shows how they started on a more typical path. They were concerned with expanding their online book sales by purchasing the largest companies to do that in the UK and in Germany. It gave them more customers in those areas and it helped them offer more European titles on their existing sites. The next one on my list was actually bought on the same day as the other two, IMDB. Anyone who has any interest in movies whatsoever has probably been there hundreds of times. There is a lot going on with it now. They actually call it the number one movie website in the world, but it was started started in England by this guy named Cole Needham as really more of a project for fun. He was a big movie fan, so he and a team of volunteers got together to create this database of movies and people who worked on movies. I realize that from our perspective, it doesn't seem like the most revolutionary idea, but there was nothing like it at the time. Then, on that day, in 1998, he sold it to Amazon, but continued to run things as their CEO. And as far as I can tell in the timeline, this was Amazon's first major push into something outside side of books. They were looking to get involved in other media, like video, and IMDB was the perfect way to get started. They were seen as a good fit because they had also prided themselves as being very customer-centric, and it's believed that Amazon wanted their collection of information so that they can use it to generate accurate search results and recommendations, which was a big contributor in their early success. Today, not surprisingly, if you're looking at a movie on there, they'll give you that little button where you could watch it on their Prime Video service. Or on the other end, if you're looking on Prime Video, you 
can commonly see that IMDb score. Also, for a layer of acquisition inception, <laughs> to force a clunky movie reference, in 2008, IMDb bought Box Office Mojo. That is a complimentary movie site that focuses more on box office figures. So there you go, two of the biggest movie-related websites, both owned by Amazon. The next one on my list is Audible, which leads me to today's sponsor. No, that's just a joke. But in 2008, Amazon bought the popular audiobook provider for $300 million, which was actually 23% more than they were trading for. There were a few things motivating them to pay that premium. For one, this was part of Amazon's aggressive push toward digital books. And I have to say, for an online book retailer, I can't think of anything that makes more sense than digital books. They had introduced their popular Kindle not even a year earlier, and now audiobooks was the next big way to get involved. The other aspect was their competition with Apple. See, the year before, they had also launched Amazon MP3, which was like their equivalent to iTunes. Amazon had already sold CDs to complement their book sales going back to very early on, and this was their way to make a digital store for their music, much like they were doing with their books. About a quarter of Audible's audiobooks were already sold using iTunes, so the services were competing in that way in addition to the music, and buying them was like a way to keep them away from Apple while strengthening their own downloads. So today, it's all in integrated together. If you go to buy a book on Amazon, they will give you the option of the physical copy, the Kindle version, or the audiobook version through Audible. The next one I have on the list is the popular online shoe retailer Zappos. In 2009, Amazon bought them in a deal that I believe was ultimately valued at over $900 million, making this their largest acquisition to that point. Again, looking at the timeline, this right here was Amazon's first major push outside of media. As we've seen, before they were all about books and music and video, and now they were interested in, apparently, shoes. I mean, they already had this whole e-commerce thing down, so it made sense to expand into other products, and they were actually already trying to get involved in shoes before this. About a year and a half earlier, they had started a completely separate website called Endless.com that sold mostly women's shoes and accessories. I don't believe it was all that successful, so I could see why they wanted to acquire an already established business like Zappos. And Zappos was already using that same long-term, customer-oriented approach. They offered things like low prices, free shipping, easy returns, so Amazon saw this as being a good fit. Okay, the list just keeps getting bigger. The next one on it is Twitch. The popular video game streaming website was bought by Amazon in 2014 for $970 million. They'd only been around for about three years and were growing really fast, already accounting for 40% of all live stream content on the internet. Twitch was out there looking for a larger company to help fund that growth, and it was looking like that company was actually going to be Google, but since they were the owners of YouTube, there may have been concerns of a monopoly, so that one never happened. Amazon bought them because they had obviously been involved in media sales, and more specifically, even video games. A couple years earlier, they had established Amazon Game Studios, and earlier in that same year, they had bought the developer Double Helix Games. They even said that they bought Twitch to show how much they believed in the future of gaming, so many of you may be shocked to learn that Amazon is heavily involved in video games in terms of developing, publishing, and even streaming. Next up is an even bigger acquisition. In 2017, they paid over $13 billion to buy Whole Foods. It's a chain of almost 500 grocery stores known for their fresh, organic foods, as well as their high prices. Now, this one may seem the most confusing, right? Here we have a company that helped revolutionize retail as we know it by eliminating the need for physical stores, and then they bought a large chain of physical stores. Well, for one, it's good to have a physical presence as a way to sign people up for Amazon Prime members but also groceries, specifically fresh produce and things like that, are something that people tend to buy in person rather than online. I'm thinking that this is similar to what happened with Zappos, where they were struggling to sell something, so they went out and acquired a company that would help them do it better. Not to mention the Amazon Fresh stores that they had started opening a few years later. They are a different thing operated separately, but it's speculated that Whole Foods was kind of like their entryway into the industry, so that they could learn enough to start their own store. Maybe Walmart was even part of the motivation as well. They're the country's other biggest retailer that's been getting involved in online operations, so maybe Amazon is doing the opposite to keep up with them. It gets to be a lot of speculation from this point, so I'm going to move on to the next acquisition, which is Ring. In 2018, Amazon bought the video doorbell company for $1 billion. They had been involved in artificial intelligence going back to the early days of their website, trying to give the best book recommendations to their customers. From there, they utilized that technology to enter the smart home and surveillance market with products like Amazon Echo, 
and Amazon Key, Amazon Cloud Cam, and of course we all know Alexa. So they bought Ring to be integrated into their smart home line of products, and I will just leave it at that. Going back to the list, in 2021, Amazon bought the classic film studio MGM. They paid over $8 billion for it so they could obtain the rights to over 4,000 films and 17,000 hours of television. That is a massive library of content that they can now put on their streaming platform, Prime Video. Streaming just keeps getting more and more competitive, and this can be seen as their attempt to utilize the large size of their company to their advantage in keeping up with the others. I have to think that the hope is it'll make more people sign up for Amazon Prime and ultimately help them in other parts of the business as well. So there you have it, a sizable list of well-known companies spanning across multiple industries all owned by Amazon. I know that on the surface, all of this seems a little jumbled and unrelated, but I'm hoping that after learning about the circumstances behind them, that it starts to make a little more sense. They are all part of that long-term customer-oriented approach, so even though the reason or the benefit may not be obvious at first, they are all pieces of a bigger strategy that's been slowly connecting into one of the largest companies on Earth. Let me know in the comments, was I right in guessing that Amazon is bigger than you realized? I should make it clear that there is a lot more that could be said about this list, and there's a lot of other things that I didn't even mention. Dozens of other acquisitions, their logistics network, there's simply too much to talk about here, so I recommend looking further into it if you want a more detailed picture. My intention for this video was to keep it at a higher level by highlighting some of the bigger pieces that are branded differently that I think give a good overview of them over the years. And finally, the obvious question, is Amazon on getting too big. It's a common criticism. I mean, you can see how much they control here, so let me know what you think about that. And any other thoughts you have about Amazon, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.